Hey everybody, Father Scott Vanderveer here with another installment in our series on Rebuilt, Making Church Matter, the story of awakening the faithful, reaching the lost, and making parish life matter. And today I'd like to talk to you about the topic of giving. Giving is an essential part of discipleship. When a person responded in the Bible to Jesus's call to follow him, they often gave it all. They, it says about Peter and Andrew that they were fishermen who left their nets and their boat behind. They gave away their job and their livelihood to follow him. Uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they did the same thing. We know that many times in scripture, a person who was repenting for past behavior would say, Lord, I will give half of my salary away and I will repay everyone who I have wronged. That's giving at a hugely high level. How about the woman, the widow who gave all that she had, the two little coins that she put into the treasury? Some people gave a little bit of their, their wealth. She gave everything she had. So one of the things that we're being challenged about as we consider giving and looking at it in the context of the book and the, the philosophy of Rebuilt is we are not here to, to thank God for all of our blessings by giving God a tip. We're not tipping God like, you know, hey, uh, what do I have in my pocket? Let's, oh, you'd like a tip? Oh, there, there's a coat check? All right, let me just see. Uh, gosh, I'll have, I got a 20 in this, so I'll give you this. No, that's tipping God. We must start by making our giving a priority. It's got to be something that matters to us more than the, the acquisition of things for ourselves. We can't be thinking, yeah, but I really need to get this or that, or I'm really saving up for that trip. That trip is what you do with your leftover change. When you think of our, our ancestors from the greatest generation, they were always keeping coins on their nightstand in a jar so that they could save up over the course of years for something that they wanted. But when it came to building, like say the great hall of our beautiful St. Mary's Academy building built in the middle of the, the Great Depression in 1932, they didn't give their leftover change to that. The leftover change went to the trip that they were going to go on with their kids. The Great Hall was built by them giving $1 a week when a dollar during the Great Depression was a huge sacrifice. So when we talk about the idea of giving 10% of our, our income to, to the church and to other good causes, like in my case, I give 5% to the parish and then 5% to other causes that are meaningful, like Catholic relief services, like a uh, charity in Haiti that I give to, like my sponsor child in Bolivia, like the list goes on and on and on. But those gifts of the 10% level those are, those are just a starting point because we know that as, they, as we say about missionaries and being in the service, all give some, but some give all. And as there are people out there who give their all, as the widow gives at the 100% level and Nicodemus gives at the 50% level, as, as people are giving at such great levels. If Peter and Andrew and James and John are going to leave their entire livelihood behind, then 10% is really just a starting point. Uh, it's a noble starting point. It's the, it's the one that we're given in scripture. But I don't get to say what a good person I am just because I didn't rob God. Challenging thought, isn't it? So a couple of other things that comes up in this chapter in Rebuilt is the idea of the Catholic parish of recent history being overwhelmed with fundraisers. 
please buy a ticket for this, please buy this, and the proceeds will go to that, please do this, please do that. And that is a kind of fundraising that raises funds, but doesn't raise givers. That causes people to feel like they'll give if there's a chance of getting something for it. I'll give if I get something in return. I'll give if there's a chance at winning $5,000. I'll give if the bingo jackpot is big enough. But that's, that's not a form of discipleship. That's, that's kind of like playing the lotto at a convenience store. That's not discipleship. And, and for me to sound judgmental about that is really unfair because it's the way we've operated always. I mean, that's, this is what I would have thought was the right thing to do. One of the stories in Rebuilt, they said is, we, uh, we nickel and dime people so much that they actually feel like they don't need to give to church because they took a tag for this and they bought that for uh, a commemoration of an anniversary or a parish event. And they, they went and, and bought gift stocking stuffers at the, uh, the Ladies Auxiliary Craft Fair and all the proceeds went to the... And you see, we're not raising, we're not raising givers. We're not, we're not raising a spirit of philanthropy. We're raising funds. And when those funds are used, which will be almost right away, then we'll be back to having to figure out the next gimmick. And gimmicks are not a way of being a disciple. A lot of times it's hard to let people know in a way that isn't too threatening that the amount of giving that Catholics are used to depended on the near slave labor of, of religious over the years. It's a hard thing to admit, but we were always able to have a system where the priest's salaries were fixed and the nuns made next to nothing. And they ran our parishes and our schools. And the priests usually lived a very comfortable life because there were the only staff in the rectory were the secretary, the cook, and the housekeeper. And so the priests were never able to get rich, but they had a nice place to live in and they had all these comforts. People did their laundry, cooked their food, cleaned their house. But, but that's a very efficient way to live if you have all of these priests living in, in uh, little, little rooms in, in one house and sharing expenses. And then there's the nuns, 40, 50, 60 of them living in a dorm and making literally next to nothing. And so as we, as we get sentimental about those days, if remember when Catholic education was $5 a month? And then we say, well, it's so expensive now. It's just important to pause with that thought for a second. A critical thinking mindset requires us to say, why was it so cheap? Why was it affordable and to that level? Why could you send your kids to school for $5? Affl inflation aside, why? Why was it so little? Why is it so different now? Because to pay people a just wage requires an amount of giving that is appropriate. A lot of people ask, how do you have such an incredible staff at St. Mary's? And it's all from God. God has drawn the right people to us. God has filled people with a spirit of generosity that has made the way that they do their job just so spectacular. But it's also true that we respect them by paying a higher wage than other church industry standards are set. We, we pay more, not extravagantly, just the kind of wage that makes it possible for a person to consider a job in the church. Many of our staff members use it as a second career or a second income for their home. Many of them are not the primary breadwinners, but now it's possible to be a breadwinner and work in a parish but that requires people to give at an appropriate level, at a level that shows that this is the most important thing in their life. Such challenging thoughts.
A couple of takeaways I'd like to share is, people come up to me and they say, Father, can we sell thus and such after Mass? And I have the very uncomfortable response to say, I'm sorry, no. No, we can't sell tickets to this or that after Mass. And there are lots of exceptions to that right now because we do anything for the school or the parish we do after Mass. And often it's also for charity, like the projects of the Knights of Columbus. But, but what we need to be growing toward is becoming a parish that is so well-funded by the tithing, by the intentional percentage giving of our parishioners, that we don't require to sell something in order to raise money for a necessary ministry. We are in the position to just give, to have a council of parishioners or to consult our small groups and ask them, which of these things do you think we should be giving to? And then be able, instead of selling crafts that then the money will be sent to help the suffering, ease the suffering in the Holy Land, instead we can just give that as a gift from the parish because we're not needing to create a gimmick in order to help us remember that we're called not to tip God and not to, not to give our leftovers to the poor, but to make God's will the center of our lives and to allow the way we give to be a reflection of that. Mm, such challenging things to talk about and so much food for thought. Thank you for listening and thank you for being willing to engage with me, rumble with this topic because it's an important one and it's a tricky one. And your willingness to listen to this really honors the importance that this has in all of our lives. Thank you for your commitment to our beautiful parish. May God bless you and all those you love now and always.